Well, thank you, Professor Walker, for your kind introduction, and Okaba for supporting this inaugural uh, inaugural uh, seminar, uh, which is really uh, my honor and privilege. And uh, I see a lot of people are driving for more than eight hours to come to this uh, lecture, so I'm very grateful for that. And a lot of old people, no friends, and new friends too. Uh, because I have a lot of slides to show you, I'm not going to uh, dwell on this introduction anymore. The title itself is going to be sh shocking already. Um, maps that turn history upside down. When I say upside down, it's maybe it's east to west upside down. Okay. Um, first of all, I need to uh, give you some idea of what I'm going to be talking about. It is not about who discovered America, okay? If you want to listen, uh, listen to that, you're in the wrong room. And this is not about ethnic superiority of, uh, of the Chinese over European or Europeans over Chinese or anything like that. What it's about is the first modern world map, how it's drawn, and how it affects the age of exploration. This is entirely a history detective story, if you want to call it that way. And so it's based on facts, logic, and truth. Truth cannot uh, be without facts, and facts cannot be by logic. And that's the entire story about my talk here. Um, the outline of talk, just like uh, any reporting, uh, first of all, I'll tell you what it is. Mostly it's about a map. Call it, I call it the 1602 Chinese world map. The official name is Quen Yu Wan, which is very tongue twisting for non Chinese speakers. So I'll just call it 1602 Chinese World Map. How to analyze ancient maps, why this map is not based on European world maps, and why it is drawn by Chinese, when is it drawn, and what the map and its uh, author and the era, when it's drawn imply to our understanding of history. Now, first of all, as a detective, some of the very basic things that one had to concern with is motive, means, and opportunity. Is how to find a murderer. Okay? You have to have motive, you have to have means, what kind of weapon, and the time. And one very uh, the quote is by Conan Doyle, the, the author of the Sherlock Holmes. When all the impossible factors are eliminated, whatever left, no matter that, oh, this would be how, how improbable is the truth. No matter how impro improbable it is the truth. So let's see what this is. Well, this is a 10-year detective story that I spent the last 10 years on, sometimes 12 to 14 hours a day, including weekends, and I've traveled 90,000 miles to prove what I uh, have in mind. And I've traveled to museums, libraries in Asia, Europe, and America. And uh, also I've read a lot of books published on Google Books, uh, all free, no copyright with various languages published between 15th to 16th century, Spanish, Portuguese, um, and so on. <clears throat> and I looked at 800 maps from 200 BCE to about 1850. And of course, I have many assistants. These are the anonymous assistants who did work on the Google Earth, YouTube, images, and so on. They gave me all the information. Okay, uh, I've given quite a few lectures before this OSU lecture, um, for 30 of them in 
U.S., mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, practically all the universities in Hong Kong, plus the Royal Geographic Society branch in Hong Kong, the only branch in the world, by the way, and published two books. Unfortunately, these books are just in Chinese. Uh, so I'm still working on English. A lot of people asked me two years ago. I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> or maybe I haven't started it yet. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> when we talk about maps, drawing a world map today is very simple. You don't draw a map anymore. You just look at Google Earth or any map. Yeah. Just take out your cell phone and, and find out where you are and where you want to be. But in the old days, in four, five hundred, six hundred years ago, if you want to draw a map, you have to be there. And you have to explore and do surveys and draw pieces of small maps, local maps. And then somebody has to teach, stitch them together to a full map with standardized scale. Now, there's another uh, part of the drawing is by the draftsmen. These are drawing, labeling, translation, copying, and printing. These are, cannot be considered as authors, really, because they really didn't do the surveying. They didn't go to the place. They just draw a map. <clears throat> Here are some of the rules that we need to uh, know about reading ancient maps. The map makers know the country, the home country, best. Because you, you don't know my house map. Without coming to my house, you don't know. But you know your house plan. That's the same idea. Maps cannot precede exploration or survey. That is, there's no such thing as mental discovery. As a book, actually, a whole book is written about this. Mental discovery. Without going there and draw an accurate map of a certain place, that's impossible. That's against science. The originals are always better than copies. You cannot paint them. A Mona Lisa better than Da Vinci. As simple as that. The original is always the best, the most accurate. And all maps have the time stamp, that is, geography change, political circumstances change. They all reflect on the map. The maps I'm going to be talking about uh, mostly is the one by Matteo Ricci in 1602 and the one uh, by Martino Martini, 1655. But without including the other background maps, you wouldn't understand what I'm talking about. So I have to include the other maps. First of all, a map by Ptolemy, which is considered the father of modern geography. Well, this is not a map done by Ptolemy, who was a Greek in the second century, he only had a book, and the, uh, there's no map in it. There's only coordinates. So in 1482, people uh, drew the map based on the coordinates and come up with this map. And people just call it home, the Ptolemy map. However, if you look carefully at the right-hand corner down at the bottom, you see 180 degrees. Oh, I already have it uh, in the rectangle. 180 degrees. That's the world. World map. If you were Columbus, Christopher Columbus, would you join him? And Columbus actually, based on his voyage, based on this map, 180 degree world. Now, if he knew. Marco Polo went to China. If Marco Polo is a real person, okay, we don't know yet. There are, there are some saying that he's not a real person. But anyway, let's assume that he is a real person going to China. He spent years and years on his way. Columbus and his crew expect to be there in a month or maybe less. That's incredible. Because it, before the three months is up, that is, when Columbus and his crew arrived in the Caribbean uh, island, which happened to be October 12th. If you don't know this, next week will be Columbus Day, okay? <laughs> October 12th. 
before they, they arrive in the Caribbean island, three months later after they start, and people already had almost a mutiny because they think it's too long. Now, if they based on this map, they're very wrong. Okay? So this is the map that we're we'll be spending most of our time on, Matteo Ricci's 1602 map, which most people, most European cartographers are calling it impossible black tulip. Black tulip is very rare. There are only six copies in the world surviving. Impossible meaning by European history of age of exploration, this map is impossible, meaning they cannot do it. They could not have drawn this map. It is a six map candle map. It's pretty difficult to read it on, on this screen here. And this is the one that uh, University of Minnesota spent a million dollars to buy it, and it's sketched by Library of Congress. Now two sites have this map. And everything I said today, based on this map, can be verified on uh, their websites. There's another version, there's a color version that is in Japan, which is exactly the same wordings except a few titles or uh, transcriptional errors. And they shape everything is the same. This is much easier to read, so I use most of the, uh, of the examples from this map. The map is said to be uh, drawn by Matteo Ricci, a, an Italian Jesuit, uh, brought up in Italy in the papal estates, papal states, Mazzarata. And he went to China in 1582 and never came out of China, never left China until he died in 1602. By 1610. And in 1602, he presented a world map to Emperor Huangi. And this is the map that he presented to the emperor, the Chinese emperor. On this map, he actually said he has corrected some translation and geography errors using Chinese archives and added a few hundred names to this map. Now, this is a very important clue. We'll see later why this is so. And actually, I went to Matteo Ricci's tomb in Beijing. This is going to be in Nanjing uh, in 2010, when he has, there is a 400-year anniversary exhibition at Nanjing Museum. Um, I saw the map, the real map they brought from Italy, and the maps that supposedly he drew from the European maps. Now, here's the shocking piece. Richie's map is not based on European maps. Why? This is the map. As I mentioned, it's a map that the uh, material which is sought to base on uh, this map to draw the 1602 Chinese world map. The 1602 Chinese world map meaning it is all labeled in Chinese. There is not a single Latin alphabet in there. Okay. First of all, from the Italy from the 1602 map. I have to. I have, I thought I canceled that already. Uh, how can I do this? <laughs> this is a new one. Uh, no, oh, never mind. Now I cut it off. So we should just look at this one, okay? Um, the Chinese world map is not based on the European world map. The Italy on Otelius map is like this. This is the 1602 Chinese world map. He's an Italian. He, he should know what Italy should look like. Everybody, every Primary school kids should know what Italy looks like. It's like a, a book. There's no tip or heel on the school. More strikingly, uh, I think I. Oh, sorry. I don't know do that. 
Should and five. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have one or two slides that I prepared for a automatic display uh, expression. <laughs> I forgot to take it out. I thought I did. But anyway, this is a map in the Vatican, I, and I personally took this picture in the map gallery of the Vatican. Now, this is a uh, map of Italy that Matteo Ricci should know, because while they were building this, Matteo Ricci visited Vatican for the last time, and he saw the boats there before he left for China. So he could not have gone in Italy without the tip and heel of a boot, right? So that is not an Italian's job. And with there are a lot of names on this map that are not uh, at Machelucci's side. The Italy doesn't have Papal State, it doesn't have Tuscany, it doesn't have Florence. These names should be known to Machelucci. Very clearly, he is an Italian born in the Papal State in the era of Renaissance. Some of these names of Europe is actually Roman, very, very old. There are many Irish here, I believe. This is Hibernian, not Ireland, Ireland. And people from France should know about Paris. This is not Paris. It's Lutetia. And the uh, the two C's here is Mare Superum and Mare Inferum. These are Rom Roman Latin names, not Adriatic Sea or uh, Terranian Sea. So that really tells you something. And here is the Octavius map. It shows Ireland, Paris, and the, the boot. Now, people thought that, well, they say that Matteo Ricci drew this map and put China in the middle because Chinese call the country Central Kingdom or Middle Kingdom. So the name, the seas, uh, North Sea, South Sea, West Sea, and Small East Sea, Greater East Sea, and this is minor West Sea and Greater East Sea, uh, West Sea, and so on, according to China as a center. And they, this is what is said, that Matteo Chi wants to please the Chinese, and he drew the map and labeled as such. Not true. The European maps at the time have totally confused the common directions. This is a book that is made 10 years before Materichi's birth. That is, Materichi probably should have learned his geography of the world from this book. It says here, East and West Ocean. There's no such thing in the world as East and West. You cannot have East and West. It's either East or West. So this is one of the conclusions. Oceanus Orientalis A, Occidentalis. It's an impossible name. Impossible. This, this book is stored at New, uh, New York Historical Society. I went there. Unfortunately, they were closed down for a bit renovation, so I still haven't had a chance to see the real thing, but I will someday. Uh, this is, if that was before Matteo Ricci, this is after Matteo Ricci. It's by Giulio Alani. He drew another map, also labeled in Chinese, and this is West Ocean here. This is Xiaoyang. If we know our geography today, these are exactly the same ocean. That's Atlantic Ocean. So that's another error. That means 
The one who chooses that, that well, has to be uh, some European who drew the map and didn't know how to put this. But Matteo Ricci's map got it right, not this one. And this difference is Julio Alani never went to Beijing. He never had access to the Imperial Archive. Not only East and West are wrong, now North and South are wrong too. Okay, before that, I have to mention this map. Uh, what's in Mueller? This is another expensive map. Library of Congress bought this map for $10 million. Actually, uh, German Premier Merkel came over to New York to uh, have an opening ceremony, and this was displayed in Library of Congress for several months, the scanning. This is North and South America, pretty clear. And that's also Panama Isthmus. Unfortunately, this happens, this map is labeled 1507. It happens before Panama Isthmus was discovered, five years later. Nunez Babo was the first one who found it. Panama Isthmus, 1513, that's five years after the map was drawn for the Isthmus. <clears throat> he came from the north to the south, so he named the, the sea on his back, North Sea, and the one in front, South Sea. Uh, there are many maps, as I mentioned, the 600 maps, the 700 maps I, I looked at, they include uh, Catalan maps, Spanish maps, French maps, uh, Italian maps, and Portuguese maps. They are all slightly different spelling, but they mean the same thing, north and south. And from there on, all the maps labeled the entire ocean as North Sea and South Sea. This is a map 1589 by Octavius. Remember, Richie is already in China in 1582. This is after he went to China. It is, there is a Pacific Ocean map. If you're not careful, you will miss this. We have to focus on this little corner here. On the 1589. Okay. Sorry. Now this. Ah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is Mar del North, North Sea. Um, at the southern tip of South America. Ridiculous, isn't it? Ridiculous. That's not only one. This is another one. This is 1638. 1638, even much later. Mayor down north, different spell, but it means the same thing, North Sea. The southern tip of South America is labeled North Sea. So you can see the European cartographers really didn't know what is North and South at that time. This is, no, oh, ship and fly, all right. This is Northern Hemisphere, it says, this is Actini do Nord de la Mer du Sud. That is the northern part of South Sea. Northern part of South Sea. That is, this whole thing here is in South Sea. It's impossible. Another big error. The only thing is the Chinese map is right. Uh, I'll talk about this later. Oops, sorry. The, there's a small Label here meaning Pacific Sea, Minghai, Pacific Sea. That is what Pacific Ocean came about. The Chinese name. Because finally people figure out that's not, this is not South Sea, entire South Sea, and that's not entirely North Sea. So North Sea is now pushed back to North of England. And the whole Atlantic became Atlantic again. But 
how do you call this whole thing? You cannot call the whole thing sub C, so they move this Pacific C all the way as Pacific Goju. You get it? <laughs> it's not an easy concept. Because the only part that is Pacific is this part, exactly like the Chinese method. <coughs> this is the Pacific Sea, all right? Right next to the tip of Chile. Unless you have been through it, you have gone through this voyage, you won't be able to tell this is the Pacific Sea. The change of names from South Sea to Pacific Sea or Pacific Ocean is uh, a cat from uh, lead from the back. Okay. Cool. More ridiculous is the Arctic region. This is 1595 by Mercator. This is the uh, again it's after Mercator is already in China. Uh, just from looking at the whole thing, you don't see any dip, dip, uh, discrepancy. And if I point your attention to this whole map, you're like, ah, I'm going to cut this off. Um, I, there's a way to mute this whole thing. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, there we are, right here. Oh, OK. Ah. All right. All right, shift. Again. Yeah. Click. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is the Arctic region on the map. You see what this is? California. Ah, California in the Arctic region. Uh, there are several things that are wrong, and I'm not going to talk about it in, in this slide, but I'll, I will mention it later. Hudson Bay and some of these names here are wrong also. But this is really ridiculous. California in Arctic region. So, Mercator in 1595 really didn't know where California was. He just drew some map like this. And people believed he knew about the world. This is the map. The Chinese map with North America, South America here, and this is coming at the equator right around Ecuador. This is Asia, Europe, Mediterranean, Africa, and if I put it in perspective of the modern map, it's almost exactly the same. Can you see the two? This is from Google Earth. This is the Chinese world map in 1602, 400 years ago. 400 years ago. 400 meaning from the label of this map. Actually, it's 600 years ago. I'll tell you why. Um, compared this to Mercator's erroneous maps, it's that shows how different these two are. Now, in Canada, anybody from Canada? Ah, I know. <laughs> Mark would say so. You should know that Hudson Bay. Hudson Bay is named after Henry Hudson, who discovered, quote unquote, Hudson Bay in 1610, the year when Materici died in April. Materici died in April, 1610. And somebody draw this lake or gulf on the map. It is not called Hudson Bay, of course. It's called Philly by Sibu. But that's equivalent to this. So look at the shape there. If one enters from the top, from the north here, you will have a very narrow channel, and then it comes to a very big uh, interior. This is unlike the Altelius map, which has a wide mouth and a very narrow interior. This map cannot be drawn from Altelius map and get it right. Impossible. <clears throat> 
That's another, uh, the biggest river in Canada, the McKinsey River, appeared in the 1602 map before McKinsey found it or reached it in 1589, almost 190 years after. Okay, this is, we come to American geography now. This is success for all your, your knowledge of, high school knowledge of America. On this map, on the Chinese world map, every red dot here I marked is a name that never appeared in any European world map. It is in Chinese. You never found an equivalent of these names in European world map. Meaning, these names have to be given by just Chinese, no, nobody else, because there's no English translation of these names. So that's one big uh, clue that we should bear in mind. <clears throat> and we all know that about American history, there were 13 colonies to start with in 1776, and then by 1776 there's a a map, colonial, 1766, that's 10 years before independence. This is the American map. There's no, nothing beyond this Mississippi River, right? And we all know that 1804 to 1806 is when Lewis and Clark, right after the Louisiana Purchase, they uh, had an expedition to the west, and for, for the first time, they saw the Pacific Ocean. This is another th interesting thing. How do you know that there's a Pacific Ocean out there before you discover, before you reach it? Unless you have a map, or unless somebody already told you, there's a Pacific Ocean out there. Go for it. <clears throat> but they did, and they saw the Pacific Ocean, but they, all they did is came to this part. They never came down here and explored this part. And this is Spanish territory. And how did the Chinese map get this part right? <clears throat> you look at the Altelius map, 1570, Altelius. The western part is already there. And here is the Hudson Bay, is the western part. And some maps later on even connected America to Asia. But this one clearly separated America from Asia before it was discovered and named after Bering. Remember Bering Strait? It's before Bering came to this. So the strait is already here, and the map is 1570. All right? Many, many discrepancies. Okay, here comes the most interesting part. <coughs> um, I just picked three locations that are on the Chinese map. Um, this is the Sui so Taotong, meaning a mountain with tidal war. This is at Anchorage. May Wan, this is a little bit more typical because there's a lot of hills in this area. And this is snow mountain, meaning a mountain that's snow-capped all year round, which is Mount Rainier. The assignment that I place is, is no uh, accident. You can look at the latitude. This is at 45, 55, and 60, exactly like today's uh, label, label on our maps. I so in order to verify these names, I actually took a 12,000 kilometer trip just in July to verify this. Okay, I'll show you some of the pictures later. Now, at the time when Meteorology was in China, 1594, Petrus Francius had another map, another world map. I'm just showing you the American part of it. It has several uh, Cabo de Corrientes, meaning uh, current mountains, not really high or mountains, current mountains. 
And then you have several beautiful bay, uh, Bay Bermosa. And then uh, for the, for the uh, snow mountain, it's Cabo Blanco, it's White Top Mountain. Blanco or Sierra Nevada. We don't all know this. However, you cannot label these in a neighborhood with the same name. That would be very confusing for anybody who wants to visit this area. Which one is true? They're all the same, same name. So obviously, <coughs> Francis had someone reported to him about these names, yet they are not sure where they are. So they have to put them all in the same place. Oh, you said, it's over here? Okay, let's put one over here. Oh no, somebody said, it's over here, so let's put one over there. That's the way how this map was drawn. <clears throat> there is no mountain. Uh, I had one that is taken from the plane for some probably 500 kilometers on the plane. When we flew over Canada, we saw the uh, Mount Rainier. Not as beautiful as this, so I, I'm gonna skip that one and use this one. If you drive down Seattle on Route 5, Highway 5, all you see is this mountain. Anywhere you go, you can't miss this. It's all, always in front of you. If you have driven down, down Highway 5, you will have that experience if I did. This is what the map called Shiasan Snow Mountain. Always snow capped. It's a symbol of the Washington State. You can see it 200 kilometers away. May one beautiful bay is a little bit more difficult because I said there are a lot of beautiful bays around this area. Uh, they are all fields from Ketchikan to Juno. There are many, many beautiful bays, so this may be more difficult to assign. For this tidal peak or tidal four mountain, it's very easy. The entire western part of America, there's only one, only one place that has tidal board. Tidal board is not just tide, it's a certain time of the month, uh, you have a tide coming in that people can serve on. Let's see if this is on a, no. That's the tidal wall. The most important one, most, the, the most uh, uh, <clears throat> interesting one is the one in Hangzhou, in China, near Qianhangjiang. And I believe people who, who have seen it in, in this group, there must be people who have been, I've been there, but at, at the wrong time. Chenata Chow is a, is a funnel shaped bay. Once the uh, two or three days around the full moon or the, the new moon, the tide was rushing, and it's like a uh, many changing uh, one. Pushing the weight all the all along, just like that, and this is where this part is. From Anchorage, there is a little inlet here. It's a big funnel. When the tide comes in, it's just rushing with waves, and people are serving. <laughs> I actually went there to take a look, and I saw the tide, but it's not the the best time of the, the month, so I couldn't give you the, the good picture. And this is the, the route I drove. <clears throat> That's called Turn Again On. That's the only place on the west coast of America, north and south, that has this. And it's right at 60 degrees, where it should be. And it's labeled on the map, on the Chinese map. So we can't call it by accident by coincidence, there's no way. <clears throat> this is what I took. Unfortunately, as a rainy day, I couldn't see the, uh, the mountain right here, which is, we used to be called Mount McKinley. Now it's Obama changed it to 
the Nelly, all right? And somebody wrote on here, you can't see it, but somebody wrote some foul language up in here. <laughs> Cross out the McKinley because there was still the old, old sign. Cross out the McKinley and put on the Nally. <clears throat> I can't mention them here. Uh, this is the place that you can actually see the mountain, and also you can you are right at the mouth of that turning up. You can see the wave coming in, the tidal wave coming in. This is uh, the Nally. If you, this is. This is on uh, Anchorage right here. This is not a picture I took. So uh, <clears throat> on a clear day, you can see that. But even for Anchorage people, Anchorage residents, only 30% said they have seen this, meaning it's always in the cloud. It's very mystic. So in order for the Chinese to be able to put this on a map, and label it as such, they have seen both the tide and the mountain. And they have to be stationed there for a long time, at least for a month or more, in order to see this. Because it's seldom seen by even people from Anchorage. Now, <clears throat> I tried to do some quantitative analysis. From Anchorage, uh, this is it. One of our anchorage latitude and longitude. So it's up on the Chinese map, 60 degrees. This is all very rough because you, you don't know exactly, there's no pinpoint on the map. This is an estimate. And I could convert this to the Greenwich uh, longitude, because these are not, the original is not long, Greenwich scale. The difference is 670 kilometers with the uh, 1594 Francis map. The difference is almost four times as from the actual place to what they label on the map, it's four times. It's more difficult to visualize this, so I make it in a, a map. This is the real Anchorage. This is on the Google first Anchorage, and this is what the Chinese map shows, which is in a way still pretty close because if they talk about the mountain instead of this part, the mountain is right here, the nav is right here. So it's very close, it's still in Alaska anyway. But on Francis map, it's over here, exactly where. Uh, west of Kamchatka, you can see the difference here. So how can you say the Chinese map copy from Pontius? By the way, it cannot copy anywhere. This Pontius drew this after which is already in China. I just show one slide on the South America. This is the Chinese map. It's the closest one to the NASA satellite picture look at the other maps, the other maps of the same period, 1570, 69, 81, 62. They're all so primitive compared to the Chinese world map. Um, I think I tried to finish it in 10 minutes, see so if I could do that. <clears throat> now, when is the map drawn? It's actually not drawn in 1602. It's drawn in the um, 1428 to 1430. Why? This is the China Park. It has, this is the capital, Beijing. All these names have nothing to do with economy or political uh, significance for China. These are names given by Yung Le, the emperor who sent out Zhengke for the first six times. This is when he has an expedition to fight off the Mongolians who keep coming back. This Ming Dynasty came after the Yuan Dynasty, which is a Mongolian dynasty. But they keep coming back, trying to win back China. 
So he had to fight off the Mongolians. And that, those are the names uh, about his campaigns. And that also include a very, very tiny place, this Yuhutan, the place he died in 1424. Right? There is no significance whatsoever in the world to put this name on the world map uh, in 1602. This emperor was already dead a long time ago. This is Vietnam. It's from Anan. And then there's a note that says the old Jiaozi. This happened in 1428 when China granted autonomy of Vietnam and changed the name to Anan instead of the old name Jiaozi. That happened in 1428. So this man must be born after 1428, right? Before we can have this name. So, but 1430 is the year when Zheng He started for the seventh voyage, and he, he never came back. So there would, wouldn't be anything from 1430 on. Here comes an actual definitive dating of the map. Above Spain, it says, uh, there's a, a, a text here. It says, this is Europe. It has never established relations with China until 70-some years ago. Now that is the dating part. 70 years ago, meaning, well, the first diplomatic relation between China and Europe through the Pope is 1342 to 1347, when the Pope sent out a delegation to China and these guys stay in China, the 50 people stay in China for about five years. That is the time China established formal relations with Europe, or as represented by the Pope. You count 70 years from there, this is how you determine when the map is strong. Okay, this is a very complicated uh, chart here. What you need to look at the red cross here are the period that China had nothing to do with outside. Right? China only had open to outside during Yuan Dynasty when there's, there's a cable con, uh, contact with China in this era. And Zheng He went on for seven voyages in this period. And then after 1567, Mengqing, that's when China opened up again, and that's how Mengqing can come to China. Or otherwise, it couldn't, because this is, this is actually the uh, maritime ban. So he came to China in 1582 and died in Beijing in 1610. If you count Richie's timing in Beijing or in China, and come backward for 70 some years. It is this period which lies in the maritime band. So there's no contact between Europe and China. It is in contact with that statement about Spain. So it's this. If we take the uh, dating of the maps that he brought, that is Ortelius and Mercatus map, which is dated 1570 to 1589, and push it back 70 some years. It is this period. Again, there is no communication between the two countries, or two, the Europe uh, at the time and China. The only period that fits in this is when the Pope has contact with China in the, here, and you push forward. 70 some years. That is when the map is strong. That's right at the time of Zheng He's voyage. And there is no paper state on the map because the Pope at the time was actually in France, Avignon. 
is not in Italy. So there is no book in Italy. And that's why the Chinese map never shows the papers there. And while well, the rest of the night, I have to skip because I was getting too long. Now, the next question we, we have to ask is, did China have the technology to draw such a map? And it's so out of imagination that China could do this. It again comes from another Genesis work. This is Martino Martini, who came to China in 1643 and left in 1651. Right after he went back to Europe, he published in 1655 an atlas called Novus Atlas Sinensis, New Atlas of China. And this is just one of the 17 maps uh, with 15 45 coordinates with cities labeled with uh, according to the latitude and longitude. It is almost like the maps today, China map today. It's a little bit weird from Japan, Japan and Korea, which is understandable, it's not Chinese. But the Chinese part is almost exactly like today's. Now, note, this is a map drawn with Latitude, uh, latitude, longitude, in spherical projection, in spherical projection, which China was set to adopt from European inventions. How did this come about? First of all, can anyone like Martina Martini draw a map of China by survey? of 6 million square kilometers in nine years? You think about yourself, <laughs> give you a car, and try to draw Columbus, just Columbus, not even Ohio, how long would it take for you to survey the entire Columbus? And let's say, how about Ohio? Even today it's very difficult without aerial photography. I have one example that is Mason Dixon line, that is drawn. Um, I think I have the next slide here. And I just showed you the Mason Dixon line here. It is drawn in 593 kilometers. All right. So on the average, each person per year, the progress is 0.68 kilometers. Now this is linear, not area. Remember. Mason takes a line 0.68 kilometers a year per, per person. Martina Martini, 6 million square mile, uh, kilometers in nine years. That's equivalent to so much. So, for Martini, Marti, Martino Martini to draw a China map, he has to have the ability 1 million foot of the capacity of those people who drew the Mason Dixon line a hundred years after he died with that kind of technology. It's ridiculous. It's really not scientific. So Martina Martini really did not serve in China. He translated maps in the Chinese archives. And he actually mentioned it in some of the books that are quoted, Martino Martini. It's very easy. I asked the Chinese, if I didn't know any Chinese, I asked the Chinese to sit by me, look at the map, and tell me what it sounds like. I translated it in English. One minute per name, okay? I can do it in less than a week. I finished 1,545 names in one week. That's how he did it. And people call it the Bea Martini Acqua de la China. This is ambiguous. People translated it as father of Chinese geography. It's not. It's a priest who drew the Chinese map. 
I'm translating it, okay? Now, the United Nations says they use French as the official language because it's unambiguous. This just shows you that it's truly even French as ambiguity, right? Here's the summary of the chronology. Sun had seven voyages, 1405 to 1433. That's when Jumper died and no more. There's no more expedition. And then, uh, 1492, everybody knows Christopher Columbus. And then here is the map. You know he cannot prove, he, he could not have, until uh, a terrorist, he could not have drawn this map. It has to be from this era, because after that, there's no more uh, world map drawn by any Chinese. But the map has to be drawn by Chinese because it is in Chinese, right? Henry Hudson, Martino Martini, John Harrison is the first one who uh, made a sea crop that can determine accurately longitudes. Without a sea crop, there's no way to determine uh, longitudes. Now, this there's a bit a title actually there's a PBS uh, TV program. You should read it. And a funny thing is my dentist, uh, no, sorry, my, my ophthalmologist was interested in longitude. He recommended this book to me. And you should read it too. Uh, just about longitude. Let's see how the whole book is about how the sea crops developed from version one to version four and so on. It is a long story, it spans about 70 some years. And <clears throat> that's how long it took to be determined. Yet, on this 1602 map, which is actually 1430 map, it's already possible in the Chinese surf. Now, again, very straight, remember? 1741. That's already there in the map before Bering actually discovered it. Quote unquote. And there's the US the independence, James Hope, Charles Vancouver, went who saw the uh, the British Columbia. And then here comes the Louisiana Purchase, 1803, and then Louisiana Clock. This is 400 years difference. Okay? 400 years difference. Chinese have already been to Alaska, Canada, western part of Canada, northern part of Canada, southern tip of South America. They're all reflected on the 1602 map before epic nails happened. This is Chenhe compared to others' cap uh, capability. Chenhe started out every time from most of the time, it's about 300 some ships. And each town has a crew of 28,000, roughly. 27, 28,000. So in seven strips, totally there are about 200,000 men of participation, let's say. 200,000 participation. For Columbus, the three trips, participating in 90. Uh, this is 1,000, a lot more. And some of them, we don't know the, the number of people. The Gamma, four, there are about 100 some people. All these compared to Jennifer's effort, as almost meaningless. Now, if Columbus can discover America in three months with 90 people, what do you think Jennifer can, can do with 200,000 participations? in 28 years. Is it really impossible? Did they really stop at East Africa? That sounds more impossible if they just stop in Africa. This is how it came out in the seat. There are some very big ships. And this is not the size of Columbus, Santa Maria. We have that replica here, right? This is a comparison. The big ship of Central compared to Santa Maria. Okay? 
So, finally, I have to say that material which you really didn't draw them just now. It is not even done in 1602, it's done in 1430. This is all Chinese. And there's no way a European cartographers could draw this map. And they already said that because it's an impossible black tool. They already said that. Just people didn't click. Oh, here comes the conclusion. The 1602 Chinese world map is not a copy of Octavius or Plato's maps, nor by Ruchi. The Chinese world map is actually completed in around 1430, based on the Chinese survey of the six voyages that come to the left. The Chinese developed modern cartography as seen on Martino Martini's map, uh, Atlas, and it, in order to draw that map, they must have a certain navigator between 1405 to 1430, which then bits and pieces trigger the Columbus voyage later. Now, what do we gain by correcting this history? For me, personally, I learned a lot about doing this research in the past 10 years, a lesson how to pursue truth. For China, they gained, regained a piece of history almost lost. For the US and the rest of the world, it's a academic freedom. Integrity, equality, justice, liberty, and all the values of humanity. Because I have to say this, the resistance of my theory, my research, is higher in China than in the United States. Now you think about why, uh, I'm not going to speculate, okay? So final thoughts, truth has no na national borders. Okay? Truth is true, there's no national border. Truth has to come from facts, and facts cannot defy logic. Only true history has any meaning at all, and truth can set us free. Otherwise, we'll keep on repeating all the errors, and we'll never be able to explain to ourselves or our kids what happened. So lastly, I have to thank OSU Institute of Chinese Studies, National East Asian Language Resource Center, and finally joined our cover just yesterday in time uh, to uh, fund this project. And then I became the, the president of Junker Society of the Americas in Washington, D.C. as the only non-resident of Washington, D.C. area. And they elected me as president because I have given four seminars over there Everyone lasted about three to four hours. That finally convinced them. <laughs> and today we have a number of uh, members from Midwestern and Graduate Society. I also gave a number of seminars at their meetings. And finally, I believe they are convinced. My theory is correct, right? So here's the last thing and the first thing. This is what I. The first time I gave my seminar in Hong Kong, 2006, in July. I still remember this, July 19th. And, what, oops, sorry. Uh, what I'm holding here is the thing that triggered everything. The brass medallion that was found in North Carolina. And I was curious about this. Everything is about this curiosity to find out why. Why a main dynasty medallion was unearthed or discovered in North Carolina. And that happened to be a 10 year pursuit of truth. And that's what I gave you as a very small part on the map. The result of my research actually is two books. One on the map, the other is on cultural exchange between Chinese and America before Columbus. Before Columbus. Uh, this is the medallion itself on the cover. And with this, I end my lecture.
And the Eastern books I will present to the Institute of Chinese Study, uh, I don't know, Margaret and uh, Dr. Walker, you want to come?